Greetings, Bat Family, and welcome to Holy Batcast, brought to you by Real Fans for Real Movies. You can visit our website at holybatcast.com and also find us all over social media on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Just search for Holy Batcast and you'll find us. If you love the show and you want to support us, you can do that on Patreon. You can go to patreon.com slash holybatcast. And as always, a big thank you to our patrons. We really do appreciate you guys. You are amazing, and uh, we couldn't do it without you. So big hugs and love to our patrons out there. We're also part of the Real Fans Podcast Network. You can check out all those shows at rf4rm.com. And I am your bat host, Andy DiGenova. You can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and Letterboxd. It's just my name, Andy DiGenova. This episode, we are finally going to get to something that we have never done. And it's shocking we've never done it. And that is we're going to talk about the Batman Superman movie from 1997, a.k.a. World's Finest. We're also going to review the next episode of The Batman, I think. I think, yes? Yes. Okay, good. All right, all right, all right. We're we're excellent. Um, And so joining me for that, you hear his voice right now. It's Jamie Drewley. Hi, Jamie. Happy Sunday morning. Happy October. Time to do it again. Yeah. Oh, my God, you're right. That's a good point. October October 1st 1st is here. Leaves are changing even more. Today is... Outdoor Halloween decoration day at my house. So when I get off of here, we'll be going to Target, getting last minute supplies and spending the morning slash early afternoon uh, decking out the yard. I did that yesterday and I overdid it a bit. If I'm not like, like I haven't even finished everything, but I did it like in the heat of the day and I really regretted it. Oh, because it's still 90 degrees here. Well, you know. It's actually in like the eight or will be in the eighties for the next couple of days. But then if you look at the forecast, low sixties, high fifties for highs in the foreseeable future. So this is pretty much summer's last hurrah, even though it's officially fall now. All right. Yeah. So I also got to say, cause it's October 1st, I just published something on the real fans feed for a uh, spooky season yes. for October 1st. Yes. So yes. if this one, it's something different, but it's fun. I hope I hope you'll dig it, and I hope that anyone who listens digs it. Looking forward to it. So go check the Real Fans feed for more spooky listening, because it's October, guys. We only got 31 days to soak it up, and it goes fast. So check it out. But yeah, October 1st. Oh, my God. Here we are. All right. Well, we have a lot to talk about. Before we do that, I got to give a shout out to our pals over at Manscaped who are who are kind enough to sponsor the show. So we are brought to you today by Manscaped, who has taken a step up from Balloween to bring your your face the cleanest shave it's ever seen. So this season, no need to toil and trouble. Manscaped's all new handyman is the best way to get rid of that stubble. Featuring a compact design and next-gen skin-safe technology, the Handyman was designed to give you that smooth finish without the mess of a traditional shave. So get the sweetest treat this Halloween by going to manscaped.com and using that promo code BATSCAPED for 20% off and free shipping. And I'll tell you, I use my Handyman. I use it every week now, and I love it. Every week. (laughs) That's cute. Well, because I kind of like go back and forth. Like some days I don't do anything. I just leave it. Some days I trim it up with the handyman. Some days I still do the good old fashioned shave with the razor and shaving cream. It just depends on how bad it is and what I feel like doing. I I shaved yesterday and I probably should have shaved yesterday evening. I don't have the luxury of skipping the way you do. Yeah. Well, that's why like the handyman is like... It's a great way to do it, like clean it up quickly without having to commit all in. And I like that. That's nice. And again, I mean, for whatever it's worth, I have the struggle of very coarse beard, very sensitive skin. Electrics have never worked for me pretty much for the entire time I've been shaving, but this one does a very nice job. So I am impressed. I'm glad because, yeah, yeah, me too. It's it's perfect when you want to clean it up, but uh, do it quickly. And so it's nice and convenient. And again, I love how compact it is. It travels easily. So I'm a big fan of the Handyman. <clears throat> if you haven't picked one up, check it out. And then coming later this month, I don't know if I'm supposed to say anything. They're, they're releasing something else later this month. Let me say that. And it looks cool, so I'm excited to try it out. But for now, the handyman like just came out what a couple months ago, and I'm already been very happy with it. Is is what's coming? Can we get a hint? Is what's coming pumpkin spice? I wish, but no, it's not. 
You could, I mean, you can make anything pumpkin spice if you if you will it hard enough. So you can just buy it and like put some pumpkin spice lotion on it so it'll be scented. I mean, some some lotion, some body spray, some deodorant. I mean, I'm I'm in on any of this if anybody out there is listening. Yeah. So anyway, guys, go to manscaped.com. Up your grooming game, whatever it is you need. Again, the new handyman is awesome. I think you'll really like it. The trimmers, you can't beat. So there's the old uh, lawnmower, which is their bread and butter. It's their main trimmer, and it's the best one you can buy. And then there's also the weed whacker for your ear and nose hair. And they've got all kinds of good stuff. Deodorant, body wash, shampoo, conditioner, cologne, everything. Apparently, they have a nail trimming kit, which I haven't picked up yet, but I need to pick one of those up. So... Whatever it is you need, go to manscaped.com, take a look, and if you're going to make that purchase again, please use the promo code BATSCAPED. You get 20% off, and you get free shipping, and we would really, really appreciate that. And you're going to be happy, too. You're going to save some money, and so everybody wins. You get good quality products. You save a little money. Holy Batcast, you get to support us, and, and yeah, it's amazing. Winners all around, so we would appreciate that. So... All right, and then, yeah, stay tuned because we'll be telling you about what what is coming new from Manscaped later on this month. Um, Got a little housekeeping to get out of the way first, Jamie, because last week, last week we ran a giveaway. And we gave away, oh my God, quite a few codes to get Mask of the Phantasm on digital 4K. And so for everybody who uh, participated in that, we did it over at Twitter, X, um, Everyone who participated, and it was a lot of you guys. Thank you, thank you, thank you for helping, and congratulations to everyone who won. But for anyone who didn't win, we're sorry. I know I wish I could give a code to every single person, but it doesn't work that way. But I did say there was another one coming this week. So, just like last week, keep an eye on the Holy Batcast Twitter feed. And much like last week, a day later, a day after I publish this episode to give you all a chance to, to hear what's happening and go find it, I will uh, post another giveaway on Twitter for Blue Beetle on digital. So Blue Beetle was just released digitally last week. I've already rewatched it. I still love it. I think I love it even more now. Um, and if you haven't picked up Blue Beetle yet, this will be your chance to win Blue Beetle on digital. It's a fantastic movie. I uh, am so glad that people are finding it and people are loving it because it is awesome. And so if you don't have a copy yet, keep an eye on that Twitter space because that way you'll be able to just repost it. you got to make sure you are following us and then you repost the tweet and that's it. And then two days later, we randomly select five winners and you get codes and you get to enjoy Blue Beetle on digital whenever you want. That's what I call a true win is being able to watch that film. I know it's great. And so, yeah, folks, keep an eye on that. We would appreciate your support and best of luck. May the odds be ever in your favor. I think you guys, if you haven't seen the movie, shame on you. But I think that if you get to ch- get the chance to win it, you will love it. It's it's really good. How's I this feel- for a segue? Yeah. Can we now count that, even though I know what was said in the interview, as the unofficial start of the new DC universe? I mean, if you want to, you can. So it's funny you bring that up because I didn't want to mention this really quick before we get to the main topic at hand is James Gunn did confirm that Zolo Miraduena will continue playing Blue Beetle in the new DCU. Which I think is fantastic news. And along with that, he also confirmed that Viola Davis will continue to be Amanda Waller. And also John S- John Cena will continue to be Peacemaker. Mostly fantastic, I suppose. <laughs> um, well, yeah, give me, give me your thoughts overall before I share mine. I, I just think... We, we talked about this, you know, for a couple of weeks now, even after the, the we saw the movie... Zolo is pretty much perfect as Jaime Reyes. The the Blue Beetle movie is getting very positive buzz, even though the box office numbers may not reflect it. And we thought it was going to be a real missed opportunity if they didn't try to keep going with it. And the the interview with Gunn, where he mentioned these these people who will be sticking around for the new universe, pretty much indicates, as far as what I can remember reading, that Nothing before Creature Commandos is going to be considered as canon, Mm -hmm. but these people will be sticking around. So, I mean, we can call it an Elseworlds or whatever, but 
bottom line is this character is apparently going to make appearances in the future with, you know, Booster Gold or wherever else Blue Beetle will show up. And I, I just, I think that's wonderful. I was very, I breathed a sigh of relief and, and got a little excited when I read that because it just would have been a, a very big miss if they, if they hadn't kept him around, in my opinion. No, I, I agree with that. And I'm, and as we talked about with Blue Beetle, there was no reason that you couldn't continue because the movie isn't tied to really any version of any universe. So it's a very easy thing to just have him carry over. And I'm glad they're doing that because it makes sense. But honestly, I think it makes sense for all three of those cast members. Um, I've seen, I've certainly seen some arguing going on. Uh, we talked we <laughs> before I hit record, we were talking a little bit about Twitter. I don't really spend much time on there anymore. I still post new episodes and giveaways, things like that. But um, I do know that like some people are like, well, why them? But not so-and-so. And it's like, because these three characters, these three actors are at best tangentially related to the previous universe. The closest is Viola Davis um, because she actually did share one scene in the mid credits with Ben Affleck, I guess post, was it a post credits, mid credits, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Um, So she's the only one who even has a direct connection and it is, you know, what a minute long and it's <laughs> so, well, I mean, technically peacemaker at the end of the, that season had, the little crossover with, you know, Aquaman and Flash. And yeah, I guess, I but, guess you're right. I didn't think of that, but you're so right. But. I, I, I get it, but I mean, it, for me, I get why they're not trying to bring back Henry and Ben and Gal and, and yeah, all that stuff yeah, yeah. because it just, guys love the movies, hate the movies anywhere in between. You, you have to realize that they are trying to create something new here. They're not trying to create a continuation or, or a retcon of those things. And because of the less than favorable image and results of so much of the DCEU, can we blame them for just taking a fresher approach? I, no, I, I don't mean, think we can. I mean, that's, that's what he was hired to do. And, but I mean, hmm, let me say, I get the frustration of like keeping some things, even if they are only barely connected to the previous universe, I get the frustration of like, well, if them, why not them? for your favorites. I do get it. But at the same time, like I don't think anyone would see Viola Davis as Amanda Waller and go, Oh my God, Batman v Superman. (laughs) Right. Like no one's, I think connecting these three characters to the previous uh, universe. And so I think they're all pretty safe as far as continuing on. And it almost reminds me of like when birds of prey came out, Margot Robbie said something to the effect of like, well, it's still me as Harley Quinn. Yes, it's the same Harley Quinn, but like it's not as in it's telling new stories with the same version of the character, but it's not as hampered by continuity a lot like comic books, something to that effect. I'm obviously paraphrasing. And that's kind of the same thing here is it's like, well, it doesn't really matter, you know, if they bring up anything Amanda Waller's done in previous movies, if you see Viola Davis as Amanda Waller. It just is fine. That's just who Amanda Waller is and it makes sense and it's fine. And I think that's true for, for Peacemaker. And then as we said, Zolo like is completely in the clear because that movie is not really connected to anything. Right. So anyway, my point is, is I think it makes sense, especially like I like John Cena's Peacemaker, but you know, like I wouldn't have shed any tears if that was the last we saw of him, but I like him. But Viola Davis is so good as Amanda Waller. I'd hate to lose her. And then Zolo is really great as Jaime Reyes. And I would really hate to lose him. So for me, the decision makes sense. I'm like, yeah, I get it. Um, And so onward and upward, but uh, yeah, I guess that's where I'm at is it's fine with me. It makes sense to me. And so I'm looking forward to the actual start of the universe, which it is funny how many people are down on this new universe that hasn't even begun yet. They haven't even shot the internet, you know. They they haven't even shot the first frame of the first movie. So, so anyway, I still find it bizarre that the actual technical kickoff is Creature Commandos, but hey, you know, we'll we'll go along for the ride and see what shakes out. I guess. Yeah. So anyway, yeah, I thought it was worth a mention and worth a discussion. But let's talk about an old universe, something from many years ago, back when sharing characters in the same story was a novelty that we didn't get very much. And now we get it all the time. And it's something I can't believe we've never reviewed on the show, but yeah, 
we always meant to get around to it, and I guess today's the day. So we're going to go back to 1997, and we are going to talk about the animated, the Batman Superman movie, which is also known as World's Finest. He's faster than a speeding bullet, and he's the superhero of Gotham City. And now they're teaming up. A partnership? You're joking. To battle the most evil villains of the century. Pay me one billion dollars, and I'll kill Superman. Deal? Deal. With Joker, expect the unexpected. Look at all the toys. Santa's been good to you, Lex. He's got to be kidding. If one superhero is good... Don't keep us in suspense. Then two superheroes must be better. Think about it. It's two times the action, two times the danger, and two times the excitement. The Batman Superman movie. It's over, Joker. It hasn't begun to be. This new DVD features extras like Get the Picture Batman and Superman, The Joker's Challenge Game, an introduction by producer-director Bruce Timm, a music video, and much more. I'd say the timing couldn't be better. Now on video cassette and DVD from Warner Brothers Family Entertainment. So we got an email not that long ago from I don't know who. I apologize, but someone was like, "Hey, I was trying to find the episode where you guys reviewed the Batman Superman movie, and I couldn't find it." And we were like, "Yeah, it's because we never did it." <laughs> um, and we always meant to. And so this week, I mean, especially with like the recent loss of Arlene Sorkin, and then prior to that, the loss of Kevin Conroy, and also. Having not any huge news or anything big happening this week, it just felt like, well, you know what? Let's check that one off the list. And, uh, you know, it'll be a great way to to hear Kevin and Arlene again, but also review something that's been in our, you know, in our to do list for a long time. So the Batman Superman movie, which was also three episodes of Superman, the animated series. So, so it was going to be my question because you and I discussed it a little bit when we were coming up with using this as the topic for this week. And I had said, I've either never seen this movie or it's been a very long time since I've seen it. Cause I didn't oh, own wow. it in my library. I had to buy it just for the purpose of watching it for the show. I mean, I, I own Superman, the animated series and I was watching it and I was like, this seems really familiar to me. So it turns out, at least in some capacity, I have seen it before, but it's been a very long time. But as I was watching it, I was like, it's very segmented. Like you can tell where breaks in, you know, episodes would have been. And, you know, of course, I've seen the whole thing of Superman, the animated series, but it's been probably over 10 years since I watched it mm -hmm. the, the whole way through. Yeah. Maybe longer, maybe 15 so I, I, we'll get to it as, as we're talking about the, the show itself, but I don't remember prior to watching this yesterday, most of what happened, especially in what I guess you would consider parts two and three. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's funny because we decided to do this. It is one that I watched a lot when it was new, but it's been a long time since I've revisited it. And when we decided to do it, you found it on iTunes and you're like, yeah, OK, great. I'm in. And then I was like, well, great. I'll buy it on iTunes, too, because I should own it anyway. And I didn't even stop to think that, hey, Superman, the animated series is on Max. So if you want to watch the quote unquote movie version, <laughs> it's on iTunes for 10 bucks. I bought it. I don't regret it because, you know, happy to have it there. But. If you don't want to spend the money, it is on Max. You just have to do it through Superman, the animated series. It's in season two. It's world's finest parts one, two, and three. And so, yeah, you can just watch the three parter if that works for your life. <laughs> so I just, uh, yeah, I didn't even think twice to look uh, until after the fact. And I was like, oh, I should see what's on Max because my people might want to know. Um, but it is not on Max as a movie. It is only on Max as three separate episodes. Yeah. All right. Great. So, <laughs> so yeah, this one I owned on VHS back in the day. Goodness, you're old. I know I am, but I mean, it was Batman and Superman. What else was I going to do? So yes, for anybody who wants to watch it, you can buy it or you can stream it on Max and I don't know where else, but it's out there. And it's also like a nice quick little hour long watch. So efficient. 
60 minutes. Boom. I am curious as to see if like if it's edited at all from the episodes or it's literally just through the three episodes back to back. Well, I mean, at an almost an exact hour runtime, if you cut the opening and closing credits out of a, an animated series episode, which is going to run 22 ish minutes, give or take. I mean, the, the math kind of adds up. So, yeah, I wouldn't imagine there would be much, if anything, cut out. No, I, I mean, I don't think so either, but I didn't bother to watch both versions to check. So anybody out there who did, let me know, because I'm curious. But I watched the movie version on iTunes because I paid for it. And and again, I feel like there were spots where I was watching where you could see the the transitions where an episode would end and a new one would pick up. I mean, it's oh, not, yeah, yeah, it's it's obvious without, you know, being no opening credits or previously on or anything like that. But especially at the end of the first part, like there's a, a break where it fades to black and then it comes in and it's like, you know, new scene, new music and everything. It's like end of one episode, beginning of another. It was yep. pretty clear to me that that's what happened. Yeah, for sure. So do you, do you know if you had seen this previously or had you only I, seen I parts? had to have just based on the fact that I have watched Superman, the animated series. Okay. And again, I very much recall the first part, at least most of it, because there are things in there that I was really hoping to see in like BBS and that kind of stuff. But uh, the, again, I know I had to have seen it, but for some reason, the like the, if you want to call it the second and third act or the second and third episode, I really didn't have much, if any, recollection of any of it until it got to like the closing moments of the, the end of the movie. I kind of remembered most of that too. Mm, okay. Well, and I, like I said, I watched this quite a bit on VHS. I don't think I watched it as part of Superman, the animated series. Cause I didn't watch Superman until I think it was available on DVD. Cause this was, you know, 97, 98. This was when I was not paying as much attention to cartoons, but this, I still bought because <laughs> Batman is Superman. Um, and what's funny is I remember the, first episode very well i remember the last episode very well but the middle i definitely <laughs> felt fuzzy to me when i rewatched it last night um but yeah give me your your overall thoughts i think there is a whole lot to like in this i you know the the typical fashion that you see in both of those animated series which i consider to be extremely high quality great entertainment very well done very true to the characters i i think there's just tons of stuff to like. And I found it super, super enjoyable. I do think there might be a couple of weak parts in it. And, you know, I don't want to be overly critical because of, you know, the age and time constraints working with things like that. But, you know, overall, I really enjoyed this. And someday, sooner than later, I hope we get some modified version of this as the live action meeting slash team up of Superman and Batman. Mm -hmm. I, I know what we're dealing with in this, you know, new universe that James Gunn is presenting to us is probably going to kind of hit the ground running and have an established universe and characters and everything else. But still a part of me hangs on to that hope that someday I'm going to see the initial meeting of Superman and Batman and them having, you know, much like what we have in this film, somewhat of a contentious relationship, but them realizing they're, you know, same team and, by the end, they're partners, if you will, you know, he, he, you know, me jumping to the end. Imagine that he, he basically says, you know, we work pretty well together. Maybe we should consider doing this again in the future. And, and then one saying, you know, I don't want to make a regular thing out of this. So I, I feel all of this is very true to the characters as I know and appreciate them. So I, I, I want something like this in live action at some point, I guess. Yeah. What yeah. I'm trying to get at in a long winded sense. No, I, I think it's great. I love it. I loved it back then rewatching it last night. I, I still love it. I think that it's amazing how much they can accomplish in an hour, um, in three episodes, because it really does hit all the beats you want of a Batman Superman team up where to your point, they're kind of at odds but they do understand they're on the same side and then they sort of gain this respect for each other by the end. It's a great arc. It's a great journey. And I think that this movie 
gives you exactly what you want as far as that goes. And then it also has the secondary team up of the Joker and Lex Luthor. And then even one step further, Harley Quinn and Mercy Graves, who never quite team up. They <laughs> they're at odds the whole time. But I love that it's like it's not just Batman and Superman. It's Lex and Joker. And it's really the clashing of the two worlds. And I think that these guys just they make it look easy. And that's what I think is so impressive about it is this just feels right from the beginning to the end. And it's a great movie. It's a great story. There are great moments and beats throughout, but yeah, I have only the tiniest of nitpicks and that are, are barely worth mentioning because I think this is awesome. You know, it's my, my big, I'll tell you my biggest nitpick is that it's only an hour. I, 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 I wish it was a full movie, but exactly. I, yeah. <laughs> I feel like if this thing would have ran, you know, a buck 20 to a buck 30 and flushed it out just a little bit more. And again, not to say that it's rushed or it's not well done or, or quality piece, anything like that. I'm not trying to be critical of it. I just maybe feel like my biggest problem is I would have liked to have spent a little bit more time in this. Yeah, you know? exactly. And that's, again, that's a nice complaint to have. It's a compliment to give as I wanted more. But yeah, I think that that's the, one of the few things I, I, I wish for more is I wish it was in yeah an hour and 20 minutes and you got a little more time. You go in a little bit deeper, do a little bit more, but as it is, they cover a lot of ground in an hour and it's a really quick and easy watch and it's a lot of fun and it's a lot of fun to turn the clock back to 1997 and revisit these versions of these characters, these worlds. And there was something really fun just about that of going back to, you know, so the first time these, the animated versions of these guys met. Yeah, I agree with that fully. So this was released, uh, as a movie on VHS on October 4th of 1997. Oh, so we're, what the 26 year anniversary almost. Yeah. So yeah, you're right. We're actually not far from the, uh, the anniversary, but yep. This one is, uh, it's really good. And I don't think anyone out there listening will, will disagree. I think that's why we've gotten so many requests for it over the years. And, you know, even last night I, I teased that I was watching it and people were like, Oh my God, it's about time. Like we've been waiting for this. So there you have it. Better, Better late than never. And you do get the all-star cast. You get Tim Daly as uh, Superman. Dana Delaney as Lois Lane. Kevin Conroy as Batman. Mark Hamill as the Joker. Clancy Brown as Lex. Uh, the late, great Arlene Sorkin as Harley. And uh, Lisa Edelstein as Mercy. And I had no idea that was who played Mercy. But when you see her, I'm like, oh, yeah, I've seen her in 100 things. Um, I didn't know that she was the voice of Mercy Graves. The name doesn't sound familiar to me, but I imagine if I looked, I would see things that I knew her from. Yeah, I think that's it. It's like if if you see her face, you're like, oh, yeah, I've seen her. She's just she's been around for a long time and she's really talented. So, yeah, it's great to get these uh, universes together. I think the other nitpick I have is I wish they would have done it in the original animated series style as opposed to the new Batman adventure style. That I will agree with, if nothing else, than just for the Joker's appearance. And not that there's anything wrong with it. I just prefer the first version over the second. Yeah, and I think most fans do. But again, it, I get that shish. It's more of an indication of when this was made, which was in the thick of, yeah, Superman the Animated Series and the new Batman Adventures. during. It was during the redesign, so it's not like they were going to go back and do the original design. So, and again, that's just a tiny nerdy thing and, it's fine. I don't really mind it, but I'm just like in a perfect world, it would have been. Yeah. The original animated series designs and then 15 bonus minutes. So <laughs> that's what I would have asked for. Yeah. I'm, I'm with you on that. Um, so apparently the Joker has fallen on hard times. Batman's making it too hard for him in Gotham. And so he decides he is going to go play on somebody else's turf. And the first thing he does is steal this Jade dragon. And I thought that was a very clever thing of like, there's this Jade dragon he steals that actually is made of kryptonite. It's a very simple, straightforward thing, but I always, I always liked that of like, yeah, like it's not like he went to a museum and bought a chunk of kryptonite that fell to earth. It was at some point this kryptonite got turned into <laughs> a jade dragon and and he's one of the few that realizes what it really is was you you have to wonder was that the piece of kryptonite that fell in addis ababa 
In what? What's that? And you don't remember Superman the movie where that's actually where they get the kryptonite is this meteorite crashed in or landed in Addis Ababa. Oh my god. I the name I was like I was like I am not placing that name but <clears throat> yes, I, I now that sounds familiar. That rings a bell. So in my head that's the canon that's playing is that was where that came from. <laughs> okay. Smiling dragon or whatever it's called. <laughs> that works. That's fine. And so, uh, yeah, you find out that the Joker, he could have stolen anything, but he just stole that. So they're like, something is up and he's got a plan and he's going to offer to kill Superman for Lex for the bargain price of a billion dollars. I mean, to get rid of the biggest thorn in your side, is there a price too high? You know, I mean, right. And Lex has got it. He's got the money to spare. I will tell you, watching this. I mean, we have certainly gotten a lot of Mark Hamill Joker over the years, and I'm always happy to revisit it. But man, it's been a while since I watched Clancy Brown Lex. He's so good. He's so good. Like watching Lex and like watching him, like, you know, read the newspaper about Superman again, saving the president. And he's just so frustrated with all the good press that Superman gets. I'm like, God, like it's been so long since I have seen this version of Lex. And it's just so spot on. I agree. I love yeah. that version. It's it's so good. And and yeah, you get Superman. Yeah, what is it? Air Force One, I guess he saves that Lois happens to be on. Yeah. I appreciated though that they, you know, they were gonna take her hostage and they strap her in, and then Superman turns it upside down and she's like, Thanks for strapping me in. You you kinda have to wonder if maybe loosely based the uh, shuttle rescue from Superman returns was perhaps based on this. There is. Yeah. There are some similarities. There were things throughout this movie that I could see parallels to. Um, I mean, technically calling back to again, Superman, the movie, he saves air force one and that. So, yeah, but you're right. It is not dissimilar from, from the plane sequence in Superman returns. I, I do think it was a, a little bit aggressive. You know, I, I have to trust that Superman knows what he's doing and checks to make sure everybody but the the hijackers or whatever we're going to call them are, are strapped into their seats nice and snug and doing what he did would only cause them injury and distress. But, mm-hmm. you know, well, a, he's Superman. You've got to assume he knows what he's doing. Right, right. Yeah. And it worked, right? The president thanked sure. him. So yeah. It's fine. It's fine. Um, and so then you get a whole subplot about Lois basically realizing that her relationship with Superman's a dead end. Cause she's trying to like progress it. And even in the middle of the conversation, Superman gets called away and she's just like, I appreciate that Lois Lane who is so in charge of her life in every way. And she's always the smartest and toughest person in the room. Her, her only weakness is Superman. <laughs> And so it's the one time she feels insecure is when she is trying to, she is trying to talk to Superman about their relationship. So I, I just appreciate that moment where she's walking away. And she's like, Oh God, Lois, you idiot. You know? And it's like Lois never lacks in confidence except when it comes to Superman. No, she's, she's got some insecurities that are uh, showing right on her sleeve with this. And <clears throat> for a character that is that strong and that independent. And, you know, I, I love this version of Lois. I think Dana Delaney as Lois is, is absolutely inspired. And it's She's, one of my favorites, if not my yeah. favorite version of the character. Yeah. And I, I honestly, I'm going to call my shot now and think that uh, uh, Rachel Brosnahan is going to play very much that version or that similar to that version. I hope fingers crossed. But uh, yeah, yeah, you know, she's she's always, as you say, she's always in control of everything, but she has like no not to be detrimental to the character, but she's almost like a schoolgirl with Superman. You know, he loves me. He loves me not kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. She can't, she can't control that situation with all of her wit and all of her intelligence and toughness and everything else. That's the one thing she can't get a grip around. And I I think it's very well played. No, I, I agree. And I, I was about to say the same thing about Dana Delaney's Lois. She is so perfect. You know, and I think that's something we've said about these series in the past is they just they they nail the characterizations of all of these characters, obviously Batman and Superman. But the Lois is she's just perfect as Lois. And much like Clancy Brown's Lex, it was nice to see her again because it's been a while and you forget how good she is until you watch this. That first scene, 
how she is just unflappable with these terrorists. And then she is flappable when it comes to Superman. She's, she plays both sides. Great. I, I really love Superman, the animated series pretty much through and through and just about everything about it. If not for my extreme preference to do brave and the bold after we're done with the Batman, I would say, let's do that. But that's how much I like that show. I mean, it is a great show and it unfortunately does not get the love that Batman, the animated series does, but. Which is unfortunate because honestly, I think and this might get me off everybody's Christmas card list. I think it's every bit as good. I think that's fair. Obviously it's not as Batman centric. So some of us may not appreciate it as much, but since Superman is a close second to Batman on my favorites list, I enjoy the heck out of it. Yep. So I'm looking at Wikipedia here, and it says that the air date is also October 4th, 1997. So did it air as a movie? As opposed to three separate episodes, huh? That I could not say. I couldn't either. Like, I it's I don't know. Uh, in all the different little info I pulled up, nothing really clarifies. But according to Wikipedia, it has the air date as October 4th of 1997 as well. So it's like... Is that when they showed it and then they released the movie version later? I don't know. Well, I mean, this would have had to have been like an event level thing for those that were focused on the animated series at the time. Yeah, because I didn't see it. Actually, you know what? The first time I saw it was with my brother-in-law, Ray. He showed it to me. He like taped it off TV and we watched it together. And then I... I bought it once it was released on VHS or whatever. <clears throat> so because of the level of, I mean, would this have been the first, like any kind of motion media team up of Superman and Batman since like super friends or superpowers? Mm, yeah, maybe. So, I mean, pretty big deal. So maybe they wanted to draw more attention to it than just having the, you know, the daily after school, serialized show and said, Hey, let's, let's give them a movie on Saturday morning or in a primetime slot or something like that. Yeah, maybe they did. So yeah, anybody listening, you guys probably, if you have memories of how they aired this, did they aired as like a special event at night as a movie. Did they air all three? I don't know. And Wikipedia and IMDb are not telling me neither is the DC wiki. So I'm trying to look at all of these to see if I could figure it out. And none of them are telling me. So Apologies that I don't know, but someone out there knows. And yeah, let me know because I am very curious. You said October 4th, 97, right? Yep. So there is what day of the week that was. So there's a reason that I did not watch this when it aired because October 4th of 1997, I was on my first Disney college program. So I was not watching any TV that fall. So I don't think I saw this until I got back to Illinois in January. And at that point I watched it with, with Ray and or Dillip. So that yeah. was a Saturday, by the way. Okay. So may, or maybe it was like, yeah, special event on Saturday. I don't know. Some better informed fan out there is going to tell us. And I thank you in advance, as long as you're nice about it, <laughs> as long as you don't start with, how could you not know this? <laughs> I don't know. I just don't know. I'm sorry. Anyway, where were we? Um, Harley takes out Mercy, which begins their rivalry throughout the whole thing, which I think is hysterical. Other than the, the, you know, obviously I appreciate a lot of things about this, but I think one of my top shelf favorites is the contentious thing going on between those two throughout the episode, particularly when Joker and Lex are having the conversation yes. and those two are just like throwing down in the background and the foreground and Joker and Lex are just acting like it's not even happening. I thought that was hysterical. There were, there were quite a few laugh moments for the, for me. And that was one of them. I completely agree. That killed me is them having just this very normal conversation and around them, Harley and Mercy just can't stop fighting. So, yeah, I thought that was awesome. And, uh, yeah, it starts here because Harley takes out Mercy and she poses as uh, Lex's chauffeur. And this is where they pick up the Joker as a hitchhiker, which has become a meme over the years. Have you seen this? The meme of him sticking his leg out? No, but I find that absolutely hilarious because I've been known. Maybe I even got it from this and I don't 
remember it, that I will hike up the leg of my pants when I'm like, my wife is pulling into the driveway or something like that. You know, I'm just, <laughs> how's that work out for you? Uh, usually not very well, but is your leg just as pale as the Joker's? Uh, yes. Yes, it is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so no, it's become a meme because it's like, it's like a thing where it's that, it's that picture, but it says, we all assumed that the white on Joker's shoes were spats. But based on this animation, that's his leg, which means he's running around wearing these tiny little black shoes. Okay, then. And I never thought twice about it. But yeah, like I've seen that meme go viral multiple times over the years because of that moment where you're like, you thought they were spats, but they're his legs. All right, then. And this is where it came from. So there you have it. Um, if but I yeah, could just interject for one moment here. Of course you can. If you can please ensure that your Harley will be a better driver than this Harley, that would be great. I would love to promise, driver. but I, I can make no promises because my <laughs> Harley is fearless and she is out of control. All right, fair enough. We'll see. But right now, the way she drives her little bicycle around the living room, it, I don't have a lot of hope. All right, everybody, you got uh, about 14-ish years to get off the roads in Florida. I'm just saying. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> anyway, but yes, Harley is a crazy driver and Joker's got a proposition for Lex that he will kill Superman for a billion bucks. And this is another little moment where I've seen making the rounds recently, which is kind of random, which is where Lex says, why should I pay you? You can't even take care of a mere mortal. And Joker says... There's, There's nothing, nothing mere about, about this mortal. Yes. I thought that was a great line. Oh, it is. It's the awesome. Delivery, the, the, everything about that was on point. Yep. And yeah, for some reason, I've been seeing that making the rounds on the internet over the past couple of weeks, which is random, but it is a great moment. It's a great line and it's true. And it does just go to show where in Joker's world, he's like, I'd rather kill Superman than continue to deal with Batman. Yeah, I mean, what's he got to lose at that point, right? Yeah. Um, and it will also help his money troubles. Of course. A billion and dollars will solve a lot of problems. It will. It absolutely will. They say money uh, can't buy happiness. Give me a billion dollars and let me find out for myself. Exactly. Better be sure. And so uh, they do make the deal. Lex is like, fine, you know, because Joker did his homework and he's got the big chunk of kryptonite. So... He's good to go. And so Batman realizes what the Joker's up to. He went and, you know, he did some investigating. He saw the little sliver of kryptonite. He realized what it was. He's like, all right, well, I guess it's time for me to go to Metropolis. And so we get Bruce Wayne in Metropolis. And I will say this for all the, for all the grief, I give the redesigns of the Batman characters, the redesign of Bruce Wayne. He is a hunk. Yeah, he is. That's one of those redesigns where, yeah, they made him real good looking compared to the old version. So I get that. And I especially get why Lois immediately turns on him. It's like she's like, oh, he's probably got some trash, which I thought was awfully harsh. But yeah. Um, and then as soon as she sees him, she's like, oh, but he's actually gorgeous. But when you see how he's drawn, he is drawn kind of as the perfect male specimen. Indeed. <laughs> Um, and so, yeah, she's already frustrated with her non relationship with Superman. And then in comes Bruce flying into her life and they meet right there at the airport and they have immediate chemistry and they make a date for that night. Dinner time. Bruce is so smooth. I know. And I appreciate how she's like, I'm free. Oh, I mean, uh, let me check my cat. Yes. Yes. It's fine. So they have a date. She's going to go out with Bruce Wayne. Bruce Wayne, the guy's a stiff. He's a rich stiff. You can do much better. No? Okay. Um, and so he's going to do some investigating. Turns out that Bruce Wayne is working with Lex. They have a, a, a partnership on these giant robots that are built for space travel, for unmanned space missions. And Lex is already thinking about military applications. And Bruce is like, nah, man. In our deal... I got to approve it and I don't approve that. So you can blame it on me. Very much a Bruce slash Batman moment there that Bruce was smart enough to know that maybe Lex doesn't have the greatest of intentions with it. So he makes sure he has that loophole where Lex can't make a move without him knowing what he's doing. Yeah. 
And these robots, you know, they really, they, they never come back. You never have to worry about them again. No, no, they're, they're just on that screen that one time. That's well, it. oh, that was the other thing that I was like, hey, I've seen this before. This feels, and this came first, but it reminds me a lot of the big robots that the Incredibles fight in the Incredibles. Yeah. Yeah, that's. So I just, I, I could definitely feel like, I was like, oh, okay. Like, again, could just be coincidental. It's fine. But yeah, it, it definitely gave me shades of that. Seven years prior. I, um, I was thinking more Johnny Five meets Runaway. I mean, yeah, but yeah. Pat so, yourself on the back if you caught that Runaway reference, because that's a bit of an obscure one these days. I, I, I didn't, but I pretended to. I Obviously, Johnny Five, I'm with you, but what's Runaway? Basically, robotic spiders that inject people with poison. Oh, With Tom Selleck and Gene Simmons. Oh, weird. And Kirstie okay. Alley. What? Yeah. Is that a movie? Yes. yes oh, yes. Yep, that one I've never heard of. I'm just going to go with The Incredibles. <laughs> um, so, yeah, Bruce and Lex are a little bit at odds. Um, but Batman is in Metropolis, and he is going to see what's going on. He and Lois's date goes really well. Bruce and Lois's date go really well. and uh, But Bruce is, like, asking lots about Superman, which I appreciate. Where he's like, well, if you don't have a signal, how do you call him? Like, how do you get his attention? It's like, well, you he knows. You just you commit a crime, he'll show up. And she's like, could we stop talking about Superman? I don't want to talk about my ex at dinner. Um, but they're getting along very well. And then yes. And then Batman starts to do some investigating as well. And so he tracks down the Joker's new crew, right? Cause yeah, the Joker comes in and he, he takes over the, the mob in, uh, in Metropolis, right? He uh, yes. He gasses the the mob boss, and there to me, there's something just as scary about in the animated series where they're like, "Well, we can't kill them, so we just have them completely helplessly laughing without any sort of like coherent thought." And to me, that's just as scary. Well, but, you know, they they say they don't kill people in this, but. Whoever was the first guy to catch that pogo stick to the face from about 40 feet up when Harley was coming in the room. Yeah. He, yeah. he didn't make it. I'm sorry. Nah, I think he, that's a good point. He didn't get out. No. So, yeah. So they took over the mob. And so Batman goes to, yeah, goes to question some of these mobsters and find out where the Joker is and what he is up to. So he's doing a classic Batman interrogation. And... He's the guy isn't telling him. And then Superman shows up. And this is one of those moments that I will never forget where Superman puts his hand on Batman's arm to get him to stop. And Batman tosses him across the room. So I had no memory of that prior to watching yesterday. But when that moment happened, I went, oh, shit. <laughs> yep. <laughs> amazing that one is like burned in my mind because again i remember watching this with ray and dillop and when that happened we were all like oh <laughs> because batman would know how to leverage his weight at, at superman that superman is not used to and even superman is taken aback by it yeah because you know most of the stuff you see with superman somebody tries that and they just you know, he's like steel in that moment. They can't move him. They can't bend him. They can't get him off his feet, any of that stuff. So that moment, Superman being unprepared, I also was unprepared for that to happen. But great, great moment. Oh, my God. Amazing. So they're at odds. Batman's like, this is how we do things. Superman's like, not in my town. So they're not agreeing. And Superman immediately looks under Batman's mask. And he's like, OK, Bruce Wayne. And I love Batman's response of you peaked. That moment, I very much remember. Uh, and, the, and the little payback moment that follows is probably the one thing that stands out above all else in my memory from this because I kept thinking to myself, I want to see that pretty much verbatim in a live action film. Because obviously, you know, easy for Superman to figure it out, right? You know, so yeah, Batman yeah, doesn't yeah, yeah. know enough at that point to have a, a wet line mask or, or anything like that. But then we also get the resourcefulness of Batman of figuring things out in his own way. And I felt that that payoff was fantastic. And that also very much was that transition to end that first episode. Yep. 
Yep. I love that. And that's another one that I had kind of forgotten about until I uh, was watching it this time. I remembered him already knowing that it was Clark. And what I'm thinking of is there's a Justice League episode later on where I forget what's going on, but they have to go incognito and someone says, yeah, but what about secret identities? And Batman just goes, Wally West, Clark Kent, Diana Prince, and just starts naming off who everyone is. And they're all like, oh, crap, Batman already knew. So that was what I was thinking of. But in here, he doesn't know. But yes, the payoff of then Clark getting home. He's talking to Lois. He's getting undressed. He finds the bat tracker and he looks out the window and Batman's right there watching him. And he just gives him the little salute. Amazing. Perfect Batman moment. Perfect. I agree 100%. And Clark, touche, and just crushes the, <laughs> the tracker. So it's amazing. And you're right. I think that does feel like the 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 end of the first episode. So now they know who each other are. So even when they run into each other as Clark and Bruce, they can speak, you know, about what's going on with Lex and the Joker as long as Lois isn't around. And they run into each other again at the Daily Planet. And Clark is sort of a uh, is is telling Bruce to to treat Lois right, even though you know he uh, he can't be bothered to be in a real relationship with Lois. So Bruce is like, "Hey, hey, man!" But then I appreciated like the the stand up nature of in the next scene where Bruce asks Lois, he's like, "You know, before we go any further, is there something between you and Clark?" You know, he's actually giving him a chance and Lois is like, Nope, Nope, I'm good. (laughs) Poor Clark. And, you know, again, I'm jumping around here, but that moment later on where they're discussing, like she likes Bruce, but not Batman. And she likes Superman, but not Clark. If there was like a way to mix or match, like, yeah, I, I, I thought that was a pretty good conversation between those two, because if you think about it, that's, that's pretty accurate. It is. I I thought that was such a brilliant take and such a good way to keep Lois integral to the story of, yeah, she is in love with half of each of them, but cannot, yeah, can't mix and match. And, and I thought that was such a clever thing of, of, yeah, Lois loves Bruce, Lois loves Superman, but does not love Batman or Clark. And uh, yeah, it's, it's a frustration, but I really like it. I also appreciate that. Okay. They go to dinner once, right? Then they hang, you know, he swings by work the next day. And I think then the next time Lois is like, yeah, I'm going to transfer to Gotham. And Clark is like, really? Wow. And he's like, well, we haven't made it official, but yeah, it's that serious. (laughs) I'm like, all right, Vicky Vale. Okay. Um, But, you know, like one date. 48 hours and she's ready to to move to Gotham and she's already talking about what were you going to tell me on our honeymoon? I'm like, yeah, that that checks out for Batman. Who of us would not choose the dreamy one with all that money? I'm just. (laughs) It's true. It's true. I mean, but he should get a say is I guess my point. (laughs) My yeah, my uh, my stuff with the story issues here. It really stems a lot from this and that that relationship needed a little bit of extra time to yeah. Yeah, blossom yeah, yeah. Or, or what have you. And, and I get it, you know, it's, they don't have to get into like deep romance stuff on what is essentially a kid focused show. Just go with it. But you know, it, it did irk me a little bit. Hey, and I mostly just laugh at it. It's not even a real criticism because again, it's not, it's, it's, it happens a lot with Batman stories of like, he falls in love with them in one date and he shares a secret identity and, and it's, you know, it's happened again. So mostly just made me laugh of like, Oh, there he goes again. She already knows he's Batman. They've been on one date and they were talking about moving to Gotham together. But yeah, it, 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 it amused me. I was, I enjoyed it. So Batman and Superman do start working together. They start cooperating, even if they don't like each other's methods. And She definitely doesn't like what Batman's doing. Uh, But it doesn't matter. He still has to help her. I like the moment where Superman gets called away. He gets called away to the cruise ship. And so Batman's alone and he comes in and Lois is there by herself. And he's like, he's like, where's Superman? She's like, oh, she's, he's out to sea. He's like, I'll never hear when you need him. And so it's just up to, to Batman to 
save Lois from this rampaging monster robot thing. Um, there's the scene where Joker almost kills Superman. So Superman is smart enough. He, you know, Batman tells him what the Joker's up to. And so Superman does show up in his anti kryptonite suit where I'm sure you could buy the action figure version. And, but the Joker is like, Oh, you wore your Sunday best. And I appreciate how he's like, Oh, I'm just so annoyed. It didn't go according to plan. Oh, I forgot about the acid. So I appreciate the Joker as it all worked out and he gets the best of Superman. And then fortunately Batman shows up to help him. Well, to be fair, he did warn him numerous times with the Joker. Expect the unexpected. That's true. It's true. And Superman has that. Well, you know, you should remember that yourself because that's when Lois gets captured. Mm -hmm. Because that's right. Joker crashes his date with Lois and takes her as bait to get Superman there. Because everybody, even the Joker knows that the way to get Superman (laughs) is Lois Lane. And then making Bruce dance with the uh, gunshots at the feet. You know, I, I get all that. We're not trying to make a life threatening situation with guns and, and an animated series. But once he goes over and he's on that, uh, the scaffolding there and they're actually trying to show oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Down, it's like you guys are, are like make stormtroopers look like Chris Kyle. here. It, it's, oh my God. Through, through the whole movie, the whole movie, it was, it was like, I mean, it's, and it's true for a lot of movies. Yeah. Where it's like, as long as you run, it doesn't matter how many machine guns are firing at you. They're not going to hit you. Again, I have to let things like that go because of the the audience that it's intended for. I yeah, but no, I, I thought the same thing, right? Where it's like, it's like they're literally, there's like five of them with machine guns firing at him and it just, it just lands all around him. But yeah, they take Lois and that's where, you know, Superman shows up in the suit and then Batman follows and they end up having to, to. Oh yeah, they get locked in. And so I appreciate that there is the acid and Batman is like, oh, but it would take forever for this to burn through the wall. And Joe, uh, Superman just says kryptonite. And he's, he's like, oh, he just uses the acid to melt the kryptonite and then Superman can save them. I thought that was really great. So my expectation of that for some reason was he was looking for a container that he could like pour out on the floor and then put the kryptonite inside of the container and seal it off. Mm. You know, the acid melting, it works, so but it doesn't come back to bite them later, I guess. Yeah, no, I thought it was clever because it's like, oh, this acid isn't strong enough to get us out of here, but it is strong enough to melt the kryptonite so then Superman can get us out of here. Actually, we, we kind of passed over it, I think, when they were in kind of the first meeting in the bar and Batman pulls out the sliver of it inside the little baggie. Oh, yeah, yeah, right. I mean, I, I, that, to me, that felt, I want to make sure we call it out because that's a great Batman moment in that he realizes, you know, as soon as he pulls it out and Superman's like backing away from him, he's like, it doesn't take much, does it? You know, that, yeah, yeah, that was, that was that a great was a really moment. Good moment. I love that. No, great call. Thank you. Because I'm doing this all by memory. So forgive me. Um, so, yeah, so they do manage to escape. Joker is very mad because he's blown a billion dollars. And so he and Lex have to renegotiate. And he says, if I'm dealing with both of them, the price goes up. And Lex is like, dude, you couldn't even handle. <laughs> if you can't handle Batman, how is that my problem? Um. But they renegotiate. They're going to they're going to continue to do it. And so, uh, yeah, the Joker is back to the drawing board with with his plans. Speaking of great Batman moments, how about when Batman's like, I'll talk to Lex and he shows up in Lex's bedroom in the middle of the night? Oh, that was terrific. (laughs) That is classic classic Batman there. And I love that Lex just completely unprepared for it. And he thinks he's going to be fine because Mercy is trying to sneak up on Batman and uh, that ain't going to fly. I could see some people getting mad that Batman hits Mercy, but she had a machine gun and he only did it to incapacitate her. I I do not condone 
violence against women. However, if one has a weapon pointed at the back of my head, I'll probably make an exception myself. Right, right. So, um, and the moment that, I mean, classic Batman where he doesn't even look. He just, he knows where she is. He eliminates the threat so he can continue talking to Lex. And, and then, who of us can deliver that sort of a blow that's like an overhead swinging back fist? I mean, that's pretty impressive. I know. So yeah, that, that is awesome. I just love that scene where he's like, think about it. I'll be back. <laughs> um, and so I, I just, I just want to throw it out there on the, on the side, not that I want to be Lex Luthor, but you know, having that kind of money to have a bedroom like that in a high rise, that's pretty sweet. It is. I mean, it's Lex Luthor, you know, King of Gotham or not Gotham Metropolis. So, and then after that is the meeting between Lex and Joker where he's like, you failed and they're having their meeting. And that's when Mercy and Harley are just going at it. Which is one of the great highlights, you know, past the, uh, I know who you are now. I know who you are thing. This might actually be my second favorite thing in the movie. I, I, I just giggling my butt off the whole time it was happening. I, I thought it was great. Yep, it was amazing. And so, yeah, so Joker gets another chance. And so this is when he does the distress with the cruise ship. And so he has the... Felt very much like a Joker moment and that like Superman lands on the boat and he's like, you sent a distress signal. He's like, no, I didn't. And then Superman's like, oh. And then they look overboard and there's like this little tiny remote controlled boat next to it. Again, I didn't quite laugh out loud with that, but I was like, yep, that feels really, really Joker. Yeah. So that's how he gets Superman out there with the cruise ship. Superman has to repair the cruise ship. And that's when Batman uh, has to save Lois from the the big robot. And while they're fighting and they end up in the daily planet, right? That's when his, his mask gets torn away and she realizes that it's Bruce. Mm. Can't even blame Alfred this time. I know. Um, Oh yeah, because yeah, she's he he saves her while she's at the Daily Planet, and there's also the moment where he's trying to get out there, and he's like, "What do I do?" And Alfred gives him the Bat Jetpack, and he's like, "When in Rome," and so in this one, Batman's got his you know he can fly with his jetpack. Of course he can, which I think is <laughs> it's pretty awesome. Actually, I like it. <laughs> um, and so yeah, so. He manages to save Lois. Superman helps the cruise ship. And so now Lois and Bruce are having this conversation where Lois is very upset because he's Batman, but she's also helping him. Um, and she's like, I'm going to go get the burning iodine. And then Superman shows up and they realize they have to, they still have to go out and stop Lex and the Joker. And <laughs> Batman's like, she's not going to like this. And Superman's like, yeah, tell me about it. So I thought that was a great Lois moment. You know, we always talk about great Batman or Superman moments. To me, this is a great Lois moment because she's given him the business. She's clearly does not approve of it. Right. But she's still there to help him. She's still yeah, at his yeah. side. I mean, exactly. I, right. She's mad at him, but she still cares about him. So she's still helping. Yep. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. I, I, I just I feel that that's very, that's a very Lois moment. And I really appreciate it. Yep. So knowing that the Joker failed again, Lex is like, okay, fine. You know, I've, I've given the clown two chances, so he's going to take it back. Um, and so Superman and Batman, they, this is where they really have their respectful moment of like, you know what? I, I thought you might have some ideas because I can't, I can't find Lex. And so they realize what each other brings to the table. And this is where they decide to pair up. And you're right. This is where they're like, well, we're, we got to go out again. And so, Lois sees him suiting up and he just pulls a Batman disappearance. You know, that's the beauty of being Batman is you don't have to finish awkward conversations because you can just disappear. Yeah. Who of us would not like that ability? <laughs> I'm going to start doing that. I'm just going to carry smoke pellets. And anytime someone asks me a question or <laughs> I don't want to talk about it, I just throw one and walk away. <laughs> I'm laughing because I actually have the visual of you doing it. <laughs> I want to talk about our feelings. <laughs> I'm, I'm imagining sitting at that lunch at the, the monster barbecue place at Universal and your sister blowing your crap about how you ate that cupcake. And I'm just watching you throw the smoke pellet right there. <laughs> <laughs> Leave me alone. <laughs> so, yeah. So now um, Lex calls Joker to his aeronautics factory 
Joker calls out, oh my God, a flying wing. It's even bigger and better than Batman's. And they promise to bring the other half of the kryptonite. And so Lex and Mercy double cross Joker and Harley. And I like that Harley's upset and Joker is just amused by the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And so they think they take the kryptonite, but it's, you know, it's full of a bunch of uh, springy snake things. I, I don't know if we blame or or credit Harley or Joker for that, but either way, it's a great moment in that yep. that feels very much like what would happen with either or both of them. Yep. So they get they get the drop on Lex and Mercy, and they're in charge again. Uh, Mercy gets tied to one of the robots, and Lex gets taken hostage in the big Lex wing. That they give a new little paint job and make it a big old smile, which I also think is incredibly clever to like set up this this flying wing of an airship and then turning it into a smile. I also appreciate the fact that it's called the Lex wing. Just you know, the Star Wars geek in me just appreciates that nod. Mm-hmm. Yep. And so uh, they're like, too bad we're not going to get our billion dollars. But the Joker's like, hey, but I get this Constellation Prize. I get this awesome ship. So that'll have to do. And so I'd he have the cash, but that would would be. Yeah, same. Because I'm like, I don't know where I store that. Yeah. Especially yeah. if I'm low on cash. I can't really afford the rent to store a big old airship. And if you want to move it for the cash, who do you sell that to? I know. right? Who's in the market? Batman is your best option. And I don't think he wants to buy from the Joker. Doesn't seem likely. Um, and so Joker wants to get at Lex. He's like, I'm just going to destroy everything that you love or everything that you've built. And so he's just going to take him on a little tour of Gotham and blow up everything that has his name on it, which I also think is an amazing Joker revenge of like, I just want to blow up everything that you are responsible for. I mean, yes, other people will, will get hurt in the process, but it's about that. Um, so they fly off and then Batman and Superman show up. They've got to fight more of these robots, including the one that Mercy is tied to. So yeah, lots of robot fighting for Batman and Superman. And I wasn't counting, but I think Batman took more down than Superman did. It's very possible. He has very handy, like electrical batterings that, that were very effective at shorting out and taking down these giant robots. Batman's always prepared, right? He is. I mean, they call Superman the Boy Scout, but Batman is always the prepared one. I'm just saying. I know. So Batman chases after the Joker in his big flying smile where Superman has to finish off one last of these robots. And it just so happens that it's the one with the rest of the kryptonite on it. And I like that it's just messily duct taped to the robot. I, I giggled at that because I thought to myself, that's super flimsy, but it's also like really... What else would you do in that moment? Like you're, you're not going to like just open a panel on the thing and stick it in there. I mean, that that feels like something the Joker would do, especially in kind of a rushed situation. It's very Joker or Harley. Either one of them would just, yeah, just tape it there. It's fine. Duct tape will fix anything, y'all. Just yep. So Batman is in his Batwing. And again, this is where I was like, oh, I kind of wish it was the classic Batwing instead of the, the new Bat plane. But oh, well. Um, but yeah, he is out. So we get like almost a, a dog fight between the Lex wing and the bat wing, which is pretty cool. While Superman has to defeat this final robot. They set up earlier that Lex in all of his buildings and all of his factories, he makes the doors out of lead. So Superman can't see what he's up to. And so I thought that was a great setup because then they pay it off here where Superman grabs one of those doors and uses it to shield himself from the kryptonite so he could kill this robot. And he's like, lead line door, I got to thank Lex later. That was a stroke of brilliance because obviously Lex would know Superman's weakness. He can't see through lead and he would use that to his advantage where Superman couldn't just peek into any of his labs or hangers or anything else. And then paying it off with him being able to use that against Lex and the Joker by the end. Just brilliant. Wonderful writing there. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, that. I agree. It was so, so smart. Um, and so Bat Batman launches out of the Batwing, jumps on to the Lex wing. I guess if it's a Joker wing now, climbs in and they complete the final battle in there. But the Joker drops all of his explosive marbles. And so he tells Superman, you take Lex, I'll take Harley. And I guess we'll just leave Joker. F the Joker. <laughs> 
<laughs> he won't kill him, but he doesn't have to save. Doesn't him. Doesn't have to save him. And, and so I think this is a fantastic Joker moment in that he knows he's he's cornered and he can't get away, and it's his own little explosive contraptions with the marbles that are going to do him in, and he just starts laughing hysterically. Yeah, exactly. Right, like it's it's the chips are down, and he's just so amused by the entire situation. Yeah, yeah. I mean that 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 feels so so Joker to me. And how many times have we in our lives seen in an animated show? You know, Mask of the Phantasm immediately comes to mind, or the end of uh, uh, Death on the Family back in eighty seven ish. You would just assume Joker's dead, and Batman at this point knows. Like I, I almost wanted this moment in here, but like I, I distinctly recall that panel in the end of death in the family where, you know, the, the, I think it was a helicopter goes down and Superman's trying to get Batman out of the river, or the Harbor. And, you know, Batman's just sitting there flailing all these yelling at Superman is find the body, find the body. Cause he knows, you know, we assume Joker's dead, but we know Joker's coming back sooner than yep. later. You know? Yeah. Always. The, it, it's a classic Joker thing where presumed dead Harley yells out something about pudding and Batman makes the, the wry comment of, yeah, by now he probably is or something like that. You know? I love that. Yeah. <laughs> She's like, put in. And he's like, by now he probably is. <laughs> That's pretty good. <laughs> pretty morbid, but good. So I, I don't know. I, I, maybe it's not as, as recognized of a Joker trope or villain trope that, it, that it once was 35 years ago or whatever. But I just always like that where, you know, you just, Joker can't possibly get out of this one, right? But right. You know, they they even mentioned in the is it a newscast or whatever at the end is like they still can't find the body of the Joker. And you know, those of us in the know are like, of course you can't. I I expected, like you said, some shot or comment from Bruce where he he lets us know that he knows the Joker will be back. Yeah. I, I would have appreciated that being thrown in there, but just the same. I thought it was pretty well done. Oh no, it was very well done. But yeah, like you, you assume that everyone else, everyone else thinks the Joker's dead. Only Batman is the one who knows. No, he'll be back. But yeah, it crashes. And so they all assume he's dead. Harley goes back to Arkham. The shot of mercy watching that happen and laughing at it is amazing. Mm-hmm. I also love Harley <laughs> being like, what did she say? I want a lawyer. I want a doctor. I want a cheese sandwich. Yes. That's pretty awesome. Um, And Lex, you know, is being questioned by for all of his activities and Bruce Wayne immediately cuts ties with him, which good, good on Bruce. But just like the Joker won't die, Lex, you know, he can always wiggle out of this stuff. Those high rent businessmen, man, what are you going to do? No. Um, And so Bruce is going to leave metropolis he's gonna go back to gotham and he wishes lois would come but lois says she just can't get over all these secrets and she's not sure she wants to know and bruce is like yeah i get it happens all the time it's fine such is my life (laughs) um and so then he and clark have that final exchange where like you said at the very beginning (laughs) it's like we made a pretty good team you know we should do it not that we should make it a habit And then Bruce goes, be good to her. It's just you guys now. I hope you can handle that because otherwise I'll be watching. And that's where they leave it. Bruce heads off to Gotham and the end. It was a fun movie. It was. It was. Again, one of those like tiny nitpicky things is that final conversation between the two of them. I like it. I wish it was a little longer. It's very short. But, you know, maybe that's just me. You know, this this one left me wanting a little bit at the end because I wanted it in BVS. I wanted it in this movie. I pretty much want it any time the two of them are together. It's like, I want that final in-costume conversation on a rooftop. I don't care which city it's in. Either way, whoever's home turf, I don't care. And just that moment where they shake hands and one of them just says, you know how to find me when you need me next time. Yeah, you know, I exactly, just, exactly. I need yep. that freaking moment in my life, and I feel like I've been denied it far too long now. No, I, I completely agree. I, I would have loved that. I still like this, but you're right. I think that would have been amazing. Um, but, oh, real quick, just because we, we didn't talk about it, is I loved earlier on, there's a great moment where 
Superman says to Batman where he says, thank you. I couldn't have saved her without you. And Batman just goes, I'm aware of that. And he calls the Batwing and just whoosh, away he goes. <laughs> um, it was a little, oh, that was a little bit of like a Skyhook thing from the Dark Knight. I, yes, bit. I thought the exact same thing. Yes. Um, but I just love that, like, instead of taking the taking the the thank you, he's just like, yeah, I know. Peace. And then <laughs> later on, where he says to Superman, he says, I'm not used to being saved. So thank you. And Superman's like, well, I owed you. So I loved that shift as well of of at the beginning of Batman not giving Superman an inch. And then later on, actually, you know, which you don't see from Batman a lot of, of saying thank you to him. So not to, to change the subject or veer off course here, but since you and Brendan did this one without me, uh, that's the one thing that I love the most about Superman, Batman, public enemies is not only is it awesome seeing them fight all of these other villains and heroes and everything else throughout that whole thing, which I truly, truly love, but the relationship and banter between those two, I think has never been better than what it is in that movie. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's fair. So, you know, it's established and, you know, clearly they're friends and clearly they give each other some crap here and there. But like at, in that movie, it's it's established and you know that even though their methods and styles and whatever do differentiate quite a bit, deep down, they're, they're good friends. And you, you just feel that. And I want that more in, in, you know, in comics, of course, we see everything. I, I'm yeah. not taking away from that, but in animated or live action motion media stuff, I just want more of that. And I'm really crossing my fingers and praying that James Gunn delivers that in this new universe. Yeah, no, I agree with you. I think that's totally fair and uh, for sure. But this was their first time. And then, you know, when the Justice League animated series happens, you do get more of that dynamic where, they're never going to agree with each other's methods, but they understand and respect each other. And, and it's a friendship. Yeah. That's oh, I also, I also like in the, the earlier on when they're busting into Lex's factory and Batman goes, well, there's the d- direct approach and Superman just knocks down the door and he goes, you're learning. It's those, yeah, those tiny little moments between the two of them that I think really make this something special. Yeah. And, and I don't mean to indicate that I was unsatisfied with the way that it went between these two during this film. And again, maybe I just wanted more of it. And that's that's my chief complaint about the movie is, is I just wanted more out of it and, and or not even more out of it, just more time with it, I guess, is the right way to say it. No, and, I, and I, I think yeah. the groundwork is very much laid in this one to eventually deliver that relationship I'm talking about. And as you say, You know, by the time you get to Justice League, you know, this is all tied to that universe. So this was kind of the jumping off point for it. So I'm not meaning to criticize. I just wanted to point out that I love the relationship between these two in that respect. And I just want more of it in other places is kind of what I'm getting at. (laughs) Yeah. No, I understand. And I think, again, it's the best complaint we can have is I just wanted more. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's what that's what you should want. You know, it leaves you wanting more. So, all right. Why don't we give some uh, final thoughts on the Batman Superman movie and a letter grade, Jamie? I think this is an absolute blast. I, I'm kind of ashamed that, you know, as as revered as this movie appears to be, that we've not only never done it on this show, but that I just don't recall like two thirds of it at any given moment of the day. But now that I have the movie as an individual thing sitting by itself, I can imagine this making it more into the rotation of frequent watching like a Mask of the Phantasm or some of the, the you know, Public Enemies or Apocalypse or any of those other animated movies that I really like and enjoy with these two, you know, going off of each other. So I, I think I, this one is going to be more regular for me going forward. For me, this is an A-. minus. All right. Um, I mean, this is great. And I do think, again, like if I if it were up to me, I feel like there was a way that they could have addressed what little complaints we have, which is if they had planned this as a movie from the start. And that way it could have been a little longer. The animation could have been improved a little bit more than what we got, quote unquote, for free on Saturday morning. Um, I think that would have been all it needed. 
to be like A plus, perfect. Because that way, yeah, we'd get a little more, a little more meat on the bone. And I think the animation is good in this, but I think that it's yeah, it's, it was what you got every week from the show, and it would have been nice to see it stepped up just a tiny bit for a movie the way, especially like I would say the way Batman Mr. Free Sub-Zero looked. Um, but as it is, it's three episodes put together and then re-released as a movie. But in those terms, this is great. It is great. They, they get so much done and it goes back to just how well these writers, these creators understood these characters that you mix up Batman, Superman, Joker, Lex, Harley, Mercy, And those dynamics are so well played out. The interactions are so spot on. They're so entertaining. The tiny moments throughout are what really make it special that we've talked about. It's great. It gives you what you want. Batman and Superman that don't like each other at first realize they're on the same side, start to respect each other. And by the end, they're hesitant friends, but you can tell that there will be more adventures between them in the future. It's so much fun. I think the story is very good, surprisingly good. Um, And so, yeah, I think it's a very satisfying. It's a great movie. I'm going to go with a solid A because any of my nitpicks, again, are mostly just greedy nitpicks as opposed to actual issues I have with the movie. For an hour, it's a great Batman Superman movie. And I just would have loved more. And you just had to make sure you got one tick higher than me. As, As is tradition. But I had, I had already determined that yesterday. I swear to God. Fair enough. No, this one's awesome. I enjoy it every time I watch it. And it had been far too long, and I'm glad that we finally did it, even though there's no great reason to do it this week. I was watching it. Catherine's like, oh, is it the anniversary? I'm like, no. Well, it's almost no the reason. 26th anniversary. And we know I mean, we that's true. Everything at the 26th. That's true. This week is the 26th anniversary, so that's as good as any. But I was like, no, we just didn't know what else to do this week, and... We'd been meaning to do this for years now. And again, it was wonderful to hear Arlene Sorkin as Harley Quinn. It was wonderful to hear Kevin Conroy as Batman. And then everyone else, even though they're still with us. Yeah, all these versions of these characters. Well, so I, I think we lost Ephraim Zembalist Jr. a couple of years ago, didn't we? Oh, uh, probably. Most likely. Hold on, I can tell you because I have IMDb open. In 2014. Oh, that was longer than my thought. That was a while ago, almost 10 years, but that's okay. But yep, the Batman Superman movie is awesome. I do not regret the $9.99 I spent on iTunes, but if you don't want to spend it, that's okay. I get it. You can just watch the three episodes on Max and good enough, close enough. But it's a great watch. It's a great time to revisit for no other reason than it's awesome. And it's 60 minutes of happiness with Batman and Superman. And what more do you need, really? I usually don't like paying over, you know, of course we love the digital discount bin at $4.99, but uh, usually I won't pay much over $7.99 for something unless it's like a fairly new release movie. I'll go like $9.99 or something, but I have absolutely no shame or regret about spending 10 bucks on this. No, me either. Yep. I should have it in my digital collection regardless. So I have no, uh, no regrets. Yeah. Call it my penance for waiting this long to watch it. Yeah, for sure. All right, the Batman Superman movie. Check it out this week. Put your Scarathon on hold just for an hour and watch it because it's a great throwback and it's a great movie. We also watched more animated Batman, this time for real, because we watched the next episode of The Batman. So last time me and Brendan covered the laughing bat. So this time we are on what? Season two, episode five, Swamped. We get to meet this version of Killer Croc. This was directed by Brandon Vietti, written by Thomas Pugsley and Greg Klein. It aired on June 11th of 2005. So there's a new villain in Gotham and it's Killer Croc. And he's voiced by the great Ron Perlman, which I didn't realize to the end credits. I did not either. It did not sound a bit like him to me. I love it. When I saw that, I was like, he could have been a good live action killer. Croc. <laughs> um, 
But yeah, that was fun. He's a very Cajun killer croc and kind of like Joker in the Batman Superman movie. He just comes into Gotham and he finds a gang. He's like, you work for me now. I don't care if you don't like it. You're working for me. And so Killer Croc has got his sights set on Gotham. He's going to flood the place. And he's going to use that to steal what he wants. So he's stealing like jet skis. He's stealing all kinds of things. He ends up doing a, uh, forgive the expression, a dry run with a small flood. Um, And then he wants to do it with all of Gotham because it will allow him to just steal more and take over the city. So Batman is on his trail. He's got to use all of his water gear because there's so much flooding happening in Gotham. Uh, Maybe for the Batman, too, because we left the Batman uh, with a flooded Gotham. Maybe that is an excuse for Killer Croc to show up in the sequel. I'm not sure I want to see that universe's version of Killer Croc, but okay. (laughs) Anyway, so uh, Batman is on the trail of Killer Croc. I appreciate that unlike in the Batman Superman movie, when Batman here gets a hold of one of Croc's minions, he just tells him everything without much. He doesn't give up much of a fight. He's just like, oh yeah, he's killer Croc. He's taken over. He wants to flood the place. He wants to steal stuff. Yeah. What else do you want to know? He just tells him everything. So uh, Batman in his quality thugs these days, man, <laughs> I know you just can't good, good help these days. Um, And so Batman in his spiffy water outfit with his spiffy bat jet ski, he goes, he finds Killer Croc. They have a big battle, but he realizes that Killer Croc is amphibious. He needs to breathe air. And so he manages to hold him underwater till he loses consciousness to defeat Killer Croc. Then there's a whole subplot where Alfred is taking all of uh, Batman's old evidence and turning it into the little bat museum in the bat cave, which I dig. I don't know what it had to do with Killer Croc, nothing, but it was fun to see it happen regardless. And so that is Swamped. What would you think, Jamie? Not my favorite episode. I don't think it was offensive in any particular way. I just thought, you know, super simple, you know, villain of the week, introducing new character. Uh, you know, a lot of times the the aesthetic designs of the villains in the show particularly don't appeal to people. Me, I really like how this version of Croc looks. I I think he is big. He's menacing. I don't think he strays too far from a lot of other versions that I've seen and liked on Croc. The one question mark I have, all due respect to Ron Perlman, is I'm not sure the choice of the voice on this worked particularly well for me. Like, I like the idea of, you know, trying to make it the, the Bayou Swamp boy style and stuff like that. It just, it almost sounds like, who is it? Ron Funches that does the voice of the plant on Harley Quinn. Ron Funches is, uh, is, um, he's King Shark. He's King Shark. And it's DB Smoove is the plant. Okay. So that, that's what kept going through my head every time he talked right or wrong. But I don't think it was terrible. I just thought it was a weird choice. You know, I would have preferred a little bit more. And again, my preference, a little bit more of the growly, throaty, reptilian style done with some kind of a Cajun accent, I guess. I I, I don't know. I just thought the voice didn't quite line up with the look for me. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, the plan, fine. You know, nothing outlandish there either way. I'm not offended by it. I'm not in love with it. Um, I did love the Alfred establishing somewhat the trophy room in the Batcave. I thought that was a great touch and hopefully they, they build on that going forward. I, I think that'll be a good touch in that the building of that world and establishment there. But uh, other, other than that, I don't have a lot to say about it either way. It was just for me, a, a, a fine episode. Yeah. You know, it was, it was like going back to a season one episode I, where, yeah. Where it's like, oh, we're introducing a new villain, and so we'll do just enough story to introduce this new version, and that'll be that. But I still had fun with it. I still really liked it. Um, I liked the voice. I I know what you're saying. It's not exactly what I would have expected, but I just appreciated giving it a Cajun twist. I thought that was fun. Um, As you said, I like how this Killer Croc looks. So I do like this version of Killer Croc. I like how he looks. I like how he talks. I thought he felt like Killer Croc. And... I'll, I'll even give you a real hot take. I think I like his look better here than I like in Batman, the animated series. I'm, I'm not even going to fight you on that. Cause I, Cause think I was I'm never, I was never a huge fan of like kind of the white bumpy version that we got on, on B but 
yeah, I like this version. I think, like you said, the plot is good enough, but it's a lot of fun. And do you know what I had fun with was I liked all of Batman's water gear. I liked, there was like this really cool ski, like bat boat, bat ski boat, but you only see it for like a second, but it looked really cool. And then I like that he changes his outfit and he has like the water suit and then he's got the jet ski. And I liked that this gave him excuse to use it. I like that about the show. They did it with like the winter wear with Mr. Freeze. And now they're doing it with the water wear with killer croc, but I enjoyed it. I thought it was fun. So yeah, it's nothing mind blowing. It's nothing that's going to break the mold, but it was a good time. It was a fun little Sunday morning watch with my coffee this morning. So I am not a biologist. I am not a science expert. I'm not the smartest guy in the room, nor the brightest bulb in the chandelier. But doesn't amphibian mean they breathe air and water both? Amphibian means they breathe water when they're born, and then they breathe air once they're mature. Okay. So a crocodile, I don't think is am- or um, amphibious... Oh my god! I'll I'll look it, but like I know the the term amphibious means it goes on land or water because there are vehicles right. that are amphibious. Correct. Correct. So I, I get that perspective, but I thought the actual definition of amphibian was able to breathe air and water. And again, I'm I'm not you know I, I haven't been in school for. I uh, think an amphibian again is born in the water like a frog, and so tadpoles can breathe in the water, but then once they get older, they have to breathe air. Okay. If I just wanted to clear that up, I, I just for some reason that was in my head where they're like, oh, he's an amphibian. He's not going to be able to breathe underwater. My brain was telling me that's what an amphibian is. But, but I don't think crocodiles are amphibians <laughs> because I think they need to breathe air from the moment they're born. That I think you are correct about. Um, but they live in the air and the water. So you, so here, here's the thing is crocodiles. They're not amphibians, but they are amphibious because they can yes. live. Because crocodiles and alligators, I think, and again, I'm not a biologist. I think they're reptiles. Yes, I agree. And that was your biology lesson for this Sunday morning. We're here to educate people. I think we landed on what is correct. <laughs> If we're wrong, oh well. well. We'll get the email if we were incorrect. That's right. But yes, I believe that is correct. Am- amphibious as an adjective means they live on air and water or is suited for air and water. Or excuse me, air and, yeah, air and land and water, land and water. But an amphibian is born in water, can breathe in water as born, and then has to breathe air as they grow up. Wait, my daughter's in high school science. She just walked in the room. Hey, does an amphibian breathe air and water? Awesome. I'm glad I pay for your education. She doesn't know either. So, well, I, I, I think where we landed is right. Okay. We'll take your word for it. All right. Well, anyway, all that aside, amph- amphibious tangent aside, uh, what is your grade for swamped? I think I'm in the probably B minus ish territory for this one. I feel like C plus is too harsh. I feel like B is too generous. So I think B minus. Oh, I I was going to say B. I swear. Of course. Of course. I swear. I swear. I already, I was already going to say it. It was a B. Okay. Um, Next one up is pets and it is the team up. I don't know about team up, but it is featuring penguin and man bat, which is a very interesting combo. I am interested to see how that'll go. All right. Well, before we say goodbye, we got to check in with you fine feathered finks and let's crack open the Wayne Manor mailbox. You've got mail. Maybe temporary. She wrote a letter. You're one hell of a messenger. 
All right. Uh, first one here is our old pal Stuart from Guernsey. It says, what would your dream DC project be? Whether it be a movie or TV show. For me, it would be a Deathstroke movie, which would include the Wilson family. And from what Joe said about the script he wrote for the solo movie, one of the things that I hated most is that Slade wouldn't have his rapid healing, enhanced strength or intellect, which turned me off straight away. As the experiment is one of the key factors of Deathstroke his origin and how he turned into the character. <clears throat> it just wouldn't be the same without it. It would be like having Batman without the death of his parents. <clears throat> My second choice would be the return of Keaton, but what we got in the flash is more than I could have ever dreamed of seeing. And I never thought we'd see him in the Cape again. So I'm cool with that. Anyway, hope you're doing well and having a great spooky season Stuart. All right. So um, interesting. I hadn't even heard those details about the Deathstroke movie that never happened. So that's interesting. But I agree with you. That almost feels like changing the character too much. Uh, so yeah. I, I, I'm with you. But a dream project, a dream DC project, Jamie, what would it be? Legion of Doom movie. I've been begging for it for what, almost six years now? Five years, six years. It's time. We need it. Yeah, yeah, I'm with you. I would, I would say a uh, Bat Family movie. And when I say Bat Family, I'm going with the core. I'm going Batman, Nightwing, Tim Drake, Robin, Batgirl. I'm in on that. Yep, and you know the the four of them have to take down multiple villains in Gotham. Because you need the whole Bat family. So really, it's a superhero team-up movie, but just in the Bat world. Obviously, like they're long overdue for either one of these things. I, I agree with you. I, obviously, I think there are a bunch more that I could <laughs> I could I could come up with, but yeah, I think that would be the top of my list. I, I also feel very much like we're closer to yours at this point than we are to mine. Maybe, maybe. I feel like Brave and the Bold is going to set up yours much better than well. We shall well, who see. Knows? I, maybe I maybe I'm right. going to get Legion of Doom to end off this this first phase or whatever. Who knows? But. Yeah. Um, all right. Next message is from Benjamin. It says, uh, casters of the Bat Pumpkin Pod, the new issue of DC's World's Finest, has a Nick Cage Superman variant cover by Dan Mora. I bought it. Duh. It's gorgeous. And it's pretty funny. Anyway, in the background is the 89 Batmobile following the Batman Superman theme of the comic. So for my question. Let's say that a Tim Burton World's Finest movie was greenlit in the 90s. Nick Cage meets Michael Keaton. What would you want to see in that movie and what villains and threats or settings or other DC heroes, etc.? Thanks for the awesome pods, as always, and keep the battle lanterns lit, Benjamin. Um, thank you, Benjamin. And interesting because we just talked about a Batman Superman movie. So if it was a 90s Batman Superman movie with Michael Keaton and Nick Cage, Jamie, what would you want to see? I don't care. I, I it's just whatever you want to throw at me. I mean, obviously we can't really get a, a Joker Lex team up there because Joker went bye-bye in the Burton verse, but uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I feel like that would have been almost ideal as, you know, Burton's version of, of that with featuring those actors, but it, it just doesn't quite pan out if we're already rolling with the established universes happenings and rules and what have you. Yeah. But, uh, I mean, yeah, there, there's not much I wouldn't want to see. You know, I, I'm, I'm a Burton apologist. I love way more of his stuff than most people other than probably you. So whatever he wants to give me, I'm in for it. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, ideally, you're right. It would be not dissimilar than the Batman Superman movie where I'd want to see Nicholson's Joker and the Lex Luthor from the Nick Cage Superman, which I think was also was also rumored to be kevin spacey is that correct that i don't know because superman lives was more about brainiac and i think he wanted christopher walken as brainiac but i don't remember who was supposed to be lex i thought it was kevin spacey but anyway whatever the burton version of joker and lex would have been ideal but if we had to go by continuity and joker was already dead Oh man, like who would have been left at that point? Scarecrow, right? Like if you were following the continuity, Scarecrow would have been the next big one. So I, I would love to have seen Burton's version of the Scarecrow. Oh my God, me too. How do, and how do you face, blend you know, that into work with Lex and Superman's world, you know? Yeah, yeah, for sure. But again, if that's what he wants to give me, I'm here for it, you know? Right. So, yeah, I mean, I guess. 
And then additional DC heroes. Yeah. Then I'd say, I'd say bring in a wonder woman, bring in Gina Davis's wonder woman in the nineties. Ah, uh, yes. That I am definitely there for. All right. Next message here is from Charlie. It is about our songs episode that Brendan and I did last time. It says, Hey everybody. I have, uh, I have the 10 greatest Batman songs. I have the 10. Anyway, I wasn't sure if I would like the episode, but I will forever trust you guys. And it was a great episode. So unlike you all, I am a big YouTube fan. Trust me. They sell out stadiums for a reason. They're a great live band. Anyway, not sure if this is trivia or not, but in the early stages of Batman Forever, Bono was actually offered a role in the film. It was said to be a unique character, much like his stage persona. He ultimately turned it down and signed up for the soundtrack. And so the song Hold Me, Thrill Me, Kiss Me, Kill Me was actually written and would have been, oh, was already written and would have been on their 1993 album, Zuropa. It's always been a personal favorite. Also, the beginning is the end is the beginning, although I heard it first on Batman and Robin, is forever linked to the Watchmen, Watchmen. Thanks, thanks to those epic trailers for that movie. And that movie is also highly underrated. Charlie. Um, thank you, Charlie. And I'm glad you're a big YouTube fan. And again, there are a lot of YouTube fans. I know they sell out stadiums. It's just never been my thing. But um, I do love that song. I'm with you on that. I never heard that he might have been in the movie. That's interesting. But they had to settle for En Vogue. Who I, I really liked En Vogue in the 90s anyway. So, um, and then you're right. We did fail to mention that they used the beginning as the end is the beginning for the Watchmen trailer. Good point. So my wife is a huge Smashing Pumpkins fan. And I was watching the Watchmen trailer. And I was, I re recognized that it was Smashing Pumpkins. And I was like trying to get my wife to tell me which albums this on. She's like, you know, they use this in a Batman movie, right? I'm like, what? So yeah, she knew it better than I did. All right. I mean, I, yeah, I forgot about that, but you're right. And what's funny is when I saw that Watchmen trailer before the dark Knight, I didn't make that connection because at that point I had seen Batman and Robin once, maybe twice. Like I didn't go back to Batman and Robin until 2005. Um, so yeah, I didn't even make the connection. So good, good on Zack Snyder and WB for getting another use out of that song. Um, Next message is from Marcio. It says, hey, guys, thanks for all the great work you do. We appreciate it. The Batman music was random, but fun. Two of my favorites that were missing from your 10 were Who's the Batman from the Batman Lego movie and the Music Meister from Batman the Brave and the Bold. Also, if you're looking for some episode ideas, how about some more DC animated films like Teen Titans Go versus the Teen Titans, Batman, the doom that came to Gotham and the Legion of superheroes. Just saying, keep the bat signal shining all the best Marcio. Thank you, Marcio. And, um, the Batman Lego movie is a great call. I think there are good songs from there that need to be pulled onto the playlist. Uh, I've got quite a few suggestions from folks out there. Another one, and I don't think it's in the email. So I'm going to say it now is Michael Masoon has pointed me towards the Arkham city soundtrack which I didn't know was a thing. So I've already bought that to add to the playlist. So you guys are coming through and I appreciate it. Um, Music Meister, I love, 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 but it doesn't really fit in the playlist because the playlist is all pop songs. So that's why I didn't make the list. Um, as for your suggestions, all of these are on the to-do list. So they were already on the to-do list. Um, actually, this week we almost did Legion of Superheroes, but... Our pals over at the Fire Rises just did theirs and we don't want to like, you know, do it at the same time. And then the doom that came to Gotham is coming sooner than later. So, yes, I appreciate the recommendations and we will get around to all of those. So thank you, Marcio. Anything to add, Jamie? Uh, no. <laughs> Great. <laughs> oh, damn it. I jumped ahead. The next message is from our pal Julian Chan says, hey guys, I have no questions, but I wanted to add my two cents on the Bat Music discussion. Have you listened to the Arkham City album? It's an absolute cracker, and my favorite is Mercenary by Panic at the Disco. That is all. Keep up the holy bat work, Jazzy Jules. Thanks, Jules. So yeah, so Michael Masunas let me know, and so did you, Julian, and I bought it. I didn't know about it prior to that episode. So thank you both, and thank you everybody for the recommendation. And yes, the Panic of the Disco track is the first one that made the playlist, and the other one was the Daughtry one. But I got to listen to the rest of the album a couple more times to see if any other 
any other songs rise to the top? I was actually surprised <clears throat> that Daughtry didn't make somebody's list just because that guy is like such a diehard Batman fan. I had forgotten about that until... Like he, he's, yeah, Was it writing or art that he did in some Batman comics? I don't, I don't remember, but yes, I forgot about that. So I figured there... I, I'm not... I don't dislike Daughtry. I just don't really know the music or anything, so I can't really claim to be a fan, but I'd be surprised if there's not at least one or two Batman references snuck into some songs with them. So. Yeah. Well, and the fact that he had a song on the Arkham City soundtrack, and it's a good one. Yeah, I I was never super familiar with him anyway, and so, but then I listened to the song, and I was like, yeah, it's pretty good, so it made the playlist. And then it reminded me that, yes, he was a big Batman fan. Um... So yeah, there were some fun new recommendations from folks and I love it and I appreciate it. So my playlist has uh, has grown a little bit over the past week and I thank you all. Um, all right, one last email here from our pal Chris, the objective geek. Oh no. <laughs> but no, this is one. He says, hey guys, no question today. I just wanted to let you know that if you want to purchase McFarlane figures, I would suggest just buying them online, especially for a set because they can be hard to find in stores. And I also want to say that I really love I Never Even Told You the song as well from Mask of the Phantasm. As a kid, I was like, what the hell? But then as an adult, I love how it captures the film and Bruce life, Bruce's life as Batman and how it keeps him from finding happiness. Like, how would his life have turned out if Andrea had stayed and they had gotten married? It continues to paint Bruce's life as a tragedy. Anyway, keep up the great work, Chris. Thanks, Chris. Um, appreciate the heads up about the McFarlane figures. Yeah, I think you're right. I get it. Um, and then I'm glad to hear I'm not alone on I Never Even Told You because I really like it. And for the reasons you said is I, I think it's a great ending to that movie because it's very bittersweet, just like the movie and just like Bruce's life. And for me, it fits really well. So I'm glad that you appreciate it, too. I, I like the song well enough. I mean, I'm not like getting a, the lyrics tattooed down my rib cage or anything, but I like the song. I, don't, I didn't realize it was an unpopular opinion not to. But. I, I mean, I just remember when we reviewed that movie a hundred years ago, I feel like people didn't like that song, but maybe that's not the case. I don't know. Yeah, I just thought that, restaurants. yeah, but I, I like it. And as far as the, the toy thing, I get, you know, people want to be completists and get sets and all that other stuff. But when I was still big into collecting toys, which has been, you know, 20 years or more at this point, part of it for me was always the thrill of the hunt, walking into yeah, a yeah. Walmart or a target and flipping through the figures hanging on the, the pegs and all that stuff. And yeah, I, I understand the, the world's changed over as many years as I've been doing this. But still, that that was always just part of the fun of that particular, you know, even comic book shops to a degree, you know, flipping through boxes for back issues to, to fill holes in your collection. Same thing. You know, digital, obviously, it's simple. You just download it and off you go. But uh, if, there's nothing wrong. I'm not saying people shouldn't buy action figures online, but I don't know. I just I still walk through the toy section. You know, we're going to Target today to look at Halloween decorations. I'll take a pass through the toy section just because I just feel nostalgic for doing that. And, you know, even inevitably, I'll see something that I think is pretty cool. And then I'll look at the price tag and go, not a chance in hell I'm paying that much for that. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you that the, the fun is the thrill of the hunt, you know, and I love doing that, especially back in the day. But I get the point because these days. Your options are less with, you know, with no Toys R Us and no KB Toys. And so it's it's essentially Target and Walmart are your options. Um, and so it is harder to find what you're looking for. And so, yeah, I, I do get it that like, but that's, I mean, but like the McFarlane ones, they are carried at Target. And so that's why I'm like, well, I just kind of wait and see for them to pop up. But if it's something I really, really want, I think Chris is right. I just have to suck it up and just order them online. I was telling you, I was telling you before we started recording, I just pre-ordered the uh, Batman Santa Claus figure from McFarlane. Which I find crazy that I feel like McFarlane's toy division sat there and said, how can we get 20 bucks out of Andy DiGenova? <laughs> they actually got more than 20 because there's a red one and a blue one and I got both. Oh, well, oh, they got you good then, didn't they? Yes, they got me Christmas and Hanukkah. <laughs> 
All right, we're closing the Wayne Manor mailbox. If you've got something for us, you can send that to holybatcast at rf4rm.com. And that's where we're going to wrap up this episode. Speaking of toys, stay tuned. Stay tuned. There's a little oh. a little toy plan coming up. If if it all comes together. I, mean, I shouldn't say that because I'm going to jinx myself. But yeah, there should be more toy talk happening soon. Let's say that. Um, but anyway, Jamie, thanks as always. How I how I spend my Sunday mornings just with you. It feels like our time, doesn't it? It is. It's our special time. And whenever that alarm goes off, I curse your name. <laughs> we have to but, get it done before football kicks off. It's oh my god, I know. I know. It's fine. It's worth it. It's fine. Anyway, uh, where are you these days? Anywhere? Uh, Real fans groups on Facebook, smack dab in the middle of the Scarathon. We're on leg two, so I got to start ramping things up here because I'm only at like number 56, I think it is. So I'm pacing. Dude, that's well 56 in a month. Yeah, but that's way behind. Right? I think I was close to 100 by this time last year. Oh my God. No. Yeah. See, I'm in, I'm at like 36, 37. And for me, that's huge. Well, Milk's just started yesterday. So. I expect him to be at like 126 by October 10th. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, so do, doing that there uh, and also on Letterboxd, and that's pretty much the gist of my social media presence these days. That's all right. Nothing wrong with that. I mean, yeah, we are in the midst of Scarathon. It's a blast over in the Real Fans group and on Letterboxd. And like I said, spooky stuff on the Real Fans feed. So, last week or about a week and a half ago, we did a look back at the entire nightmare on Elm street film series, which was super fun. And then what I just released today, Jamie, did you see it pop up? I did. I can't wait to listen. So it is me and Preston discussing and rating all of the spooky breakfast cereals that were released for this year, which has nothing to do with real movies. I know it. I own it. It's fine. But I bought all the cereals. We should talk about them. So yeah, if you want to hear about all the fun, spooky cereals, check out real fans for real movies. Let's face That's, it. If people are into the whole October feed of that podcast, they're into the cereals and want to hear you guys talk about it. That That's was my thought. Yeah. I was like, you know what? I'm just going to own it. Cause it's all about seasonal programming this time of year anyway. And uh, so yeah, me and Preston had a blast the other day talking about cereal. So, um, yep, that's it. Real fans for real movies. I think I already told you guys where to follow me, but thank you as always for joining us here on Holy Batcast. Please do follow or subscribe to the show wherever you get your podcasts and something else that you can do to support us. If you love the show and you don't want to spend any money and I don't blame you, that's fine. Save your money. Just rate and review us. Just give us a nice review and that would be awesome. We would love that. And it does help us out. You can visit holybatcast.com and find Holy Batcast on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. If you got something for that Wayne Manor mailbox, again, send that to holybatcast at rf4rm.com. Our theme music was created by the talented Gora Venkateswar. You can find his work at gvtunes.com. And don't forget to check out our sponsors over at Manscaped. Go to manscaped.com, do some shopping, and use that promo code BATSCAPED for 20% off and free shipping. That'll do it for this episode. Thank you so much for joining us, and we'll see you next time. Same bat time, same bat channel. Holy Batcast is not affiliated with Warner Brothers or DC Entertainment. The views and opinions shared by the participants are theirs and theirs alone and do not represent the companies or organizations they happen to work for. And now I get to go upstairs and figure out what Halloween decoration just shattered all over the floor that they're vacuuming up right now. Oh no! Hopefully I hope it's not it wasn't the one a, that I hope it's not. I hope it wasn't a crystal skull. Oh, I'd rather they break the dial of destiny than the crystal skull. But. Uh, we we heard that episode. We know. <laughs> <laughs>